passado. Hello, everybody. We're going to give everyone a couple minutes to filter into the room. I am going to silence all my chats. <laughs> Just did that too. Yes. We're all pinging in here. All right, give it just one more minute because I think we had double this amount register for, for that conversation. I see that we have some artists and some clients here. Which makes me so happy to have such a wonderful cross section across the the industry. All right, we will go ahead and and get started and let more people in as they arrive. Um, Thank you everyone for, for being here today for this very important conversation around copyright. Um, I want to preface this conversation with uh, the note that we are, we are not lawyers um, and that we would encourage you. Um, we're gonna be talking about, about contracts and about legal language and we would encourage you to um, talk to your legal representatives to get guidance from them um, and ask them questions and continue the conversation that we're having here with them. Um, and also for you to determine what feels right and best for, for your business. We're here to share some of the things that the, the panelists have found that have helped them with um, charging for copyright, um, protecting copyright in the age of AI um, and and managing contracts with with clients. And again, you will need to price price yourself and manage your contracts in the best way that you can for for your business and for your artist business. Um, but hopefully, we are pulling back the curtain a little bit and having a really candid conversation. So please feel free to drop questions into the chat. We will do our best to monitor them and also leave some time for, for some Q&A at the end. So I am really excited about today's panel. Um, I'm just gonna go around and give a little bit of an, an introduction so everybody knows who everyone is and then we'll, we'll get the party started. Um, so this is Joe Naylor from Image Rights. He's a wonderful partner to the, to the AMA and we'll be talking more about what his company does and how they help you register your copyright with the Copyright Office. Um, Juliet Wolf Robin from, from the APA who is a wonderful advocate for our, our industry. Um, my fellow partner in crime, Mary from Big Leo, um, who sits on the AMA board, and Shelly Waldman, who is a photographer that isn't represented, but is having a really amazing conversation with other photographers in our community, helping them find a lens on which to see and value their, their work. Um, so thank you guys all for, for being here today. And and having this conversation. Um, and so I'm just, I'm gonna pass the baton right to you, Mary. And I just would love to get your perspective, like why charge for copyright? How, 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 how to charge for copyright? What, what lens do we need to, to remember in this age where I think a lot of us are feeling increasing pressure to just wrap everything up into one fee? Definitely. Uh, I think we've all noticed there's been a rise of wanting all rights. Uh, there's been a rise on work for hire, which is a dirty, dirty word in this 
in this uh, case. And I think that, you know, we we charge licensing fees for our copyright um, because it controls the way our pictures may and may not be used. Essentially, Shelly, just before we all hopped on, gave us a wonderful analogy with other industries to that end. And when someone pays you a usage fee, they agree to use the pictures according to the terms of that license. When they own it, they can do whatever they want. You will never see another dime. They can uh, third party license it. They could sub license it, uh, license it. Once you give it away, it's gone. And the only control you have over those images is by retaining the copyright, licensing it per the usage the client needs and charging accordingly. I mean, that's the short answer, right? Yes. I mean, when I think about what all media means, and now there's a lot of times I see that clause known and unknown no. <laughs> media. <laughs> I'm like, that's a lot. That's a lot of media. Shelly, I would love to get your perspective on the on the same question um, of just charging for for copyright and and um, how it supports um, artists careers. Well, I think my the, the best way for me to describe it is a very recent, uh, just this week, I bid a very large beverage company that everyone knows around the world. Um, they're known for their red and white label. And so um, there's a few of us in the industry who all just did this exercise. I found uh, at least one other photographer who was bidding on this, and they chose to wrap their numbers all into one lump sum. And I was kind of surprised, actually. Uh, this is somebody who's been in the business for a very long time. I look up to them. They're like a mentor to me. They've been in it for like 35, 40 years. And I sat with that for a long time when I heard that because I was in the midst of doing my estimate as well. And at the end of the day, like if you don't break out your usage fee and someone comes back to you and says, hey, like in this case, it was for a one-year usage. Um, and if they come back and they say, hey, we want to expand this and you've wrapped it all up into one number and let's just, just for number's sake, I'm going to make it really easy numbers, right? Let's say you said that number was $20,000 and now you want to charge them $30,000 for that extension. Well, logically the numbers don't make sense, right? And someone's going to say, well, you know, you only charge us 20 for the, like when you actually came and did the work and did all these things and blah, 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 blah. How are you charging us more, Right. So if you're not breaking it out ahead of time or saying what the usage is going to be further down the road, it's really hard to then have that conversation. Secondly, usage is how we make a living. Um, that's actually where you're making your money and that's actually where money comes back. I actually was in Chicago and just had a conversation with a friend of mine who like four years ago shot for, for another well-known restaurant, really big restaurant, national chain. And she shot for both their e-commerce line and the restaurant. And out of the blue, she got an email from them saying, hey, I think we owe you money and we want to license this image. And she's like, oh yeah. And she totally forgot about it. She doesn't do photography commercially anymore. She's actually on the art director side in-house at another company now. And she went back and she said, well, actually you've been using these like 17 images out of, out of date now for like three years. And if you want to license this other images going forward, like here's the lump sum that you'll now owe me. And they turned around and paid her. So this is a chance for one, for you not only to control the images a little bit, but also to really help clients understand like, where are you really using these images? Um, I think it's like a shot in the dark now when they just say like, hey, we wanna use it everywhere. And you're like, okay, but what is like the main place you actually think you're gonna put this? Yeah, that is such a good point. Um, a lot of times when I'm estimating and talking to clients, and they start wanting to know up front, hey, uh, what's your day? What's what's so and so's day rate for this project? It's like, well, I need some more information from you in order to tell you that because it varies on what it is that you need. And a lot of times people will come back to me and ask for a buyout. And I will counter by saying, I would love to show you some options that are going to make things a little bit more affordable for you. And I'll go ahead and lay those out within the estimate without people asking me and say to them, like, if you, you know, because a lot of times they'd be like, well, this is just social only, but we want to, we want to buy out. And to me, I mean, social only is everything these days. <laughs> it's like the main <laughs> form of media. So the social only doesn't really uh, resonate with me anymore. 
Um, and I set some terms to it. And I will also set some terms for a renewal. And I'll give a client like three months and I'll say, you know what, if you're really loving the way these images are, if you want to go ahead and start purchasing additional years within this 30 day or 90 day period, I'll give you a bigger discount. And so that allows me to work within tight budgets. Does it always work? It doesn't work. But trying to have the conversation about what do you really need, I have found to be helpful. Mary, do you have any strategies like that? Yeah, we do something similar where if somebody's asking us to bid for a year or two or this or that, we try to entice them to buy a longer term by saying, if you exercise this option now, it's this versus if you wait till the term is up, then it's going to be a full renewal fee. So we do something similar for sure. <laughs> yeah. Shelly, are you hearing that on your end from some of the photographers of, that you're having a conversation with? Or are there any tips and tricks that you could pass along? I will answer that in one second. I see Julia keeps raising her hand. So I want to make oh, sure I'm she, sorry. Gets, she gets, her, know, she gets sorry, her thought Julia, out before please. we move too far away. Yes. I, I was just going to say, and David had brought this up on the chat also, the idea that we're talking about a creative fee versus charging for yes. the usage. Good point, it's not charging David. for the copyright. You're charging for your license. license. Yeah. <laughs> and that and that is really important to make clear because um, as we were talking about separating out, there's there's the day of your handling the the production, and then there's the usage, which can vary and change. And then it could end up being much bigger than you had initially thought, because maybe they only start off thinking, we're only going to use this in this very small time period in this one place. And then they love the image so much that now they want it on their packaging. They want to put it everywhere. They want to do billboards and to have given it away because you thought that it was only going to be this small usage um, really under, undersells the value of what you brought, which is so much more than just having been there that day, but how the image is going to be used in usage. And you bring up such a good point. Thank you for clarifying my own language. Um, within contracts, defining what a buyout means I have heard is a very important thing for people to understand because for some people that means that you're transferring your copyright for other people it means an um, in perpetuity license for all media and there is a difference between those two those two things Julia, do you want to talk a little bit about, about those differences? I'm just going to say never give up your copyright. No matter what ever, never give up your copyright. Never let anybody do that. Even if you decide that you never need to see this photo again and they can use it any which way and you're fine and they've paid you enough, you still want to retain the copyright. And what's even better is if you register it first, which is what Joe's going to talk about. If you register it, then the copyright office knows that you, it's yours because even though you own the copyright when you've taken the photo, you do not, you, you want that extra protection to be able to show, look, I sent it to the copyright office. They have a copy of it. This was the date it was taken. You can see it here. And then there's no question about it later. So um, having that full protection in case it's used in any manner that you didn't want it used or Im improperly um, and being able to have that advantage of being able to have registered it Yes. Joe, uh, I feel like that's just a natural introduction to, yeah. to you and to, to image rights and um, love to get your perspective and just continue the conversation around these terms, buyout versus copyright transfer and, and why it's important um, to, even if you are granting license to your image with a client, um, for your image with a client, why it's so important to register your copyright. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to join the conversation here. Uh, yeah, so in image rights, we've been offering uh, registration services for 15 years now. We've registered over 1.4 million of our clients' images over the years. 
And uh, and then that's in conjunction with the the copyright enforcement work that we do. And where that experience kind of plays into here is we we see um, what can go wrong when the language isn't tight in a contract, and we can see what goes right or can go right if that language is is correct. Um, or comprehensive and very black and white, no ambiguity. Um, but just uh, just kind of a quick refresher on the whole point of registering with the Copyright Office. It, it's really to put you in the best position to pursue a claim should you find yourself infringed down the road. And if you, if you haven't registered, then uh, you don't have the ability to file a complaint in the court unless you go out and register it. I can get to that in a second. Um, and so the other side knows that, and if they have an attorney and they're savvy, they understand that you don't really have that much leverage in that situation. If you have registered, you can file a complaint, um, which gets you a little bit more uh, into a stronger position. But uh, if it's not timely registered, it's it, you're basically pursuing um, actual damages or disgorgement of profits. And you know, it depends on what type of infringement we're talking about, but for most online infringement, um, it's pretty, you know, it's basically impossible to tie how much of a company's profit is attributable to the use of the images on their website or what have you. Um, and so then you just revert to actual damages and it's whatever the, the normal licensing fee would be. But importantly, if it's not timely registered, and I'll define that in a second, it, um, you don't have the ability to pursue attorney's fees. And so, Lawyers are not as uh, compelled to represent these cases where, you know, at most you might be able to get a, a license fee uh, and that uh, is quite likely to be less than what their billable hours would be for even pursuing that case. So really the, the what you are really going for and frankly why um, making registration as part of your workflow is so important is that you want to be in a position where your claim is timely registered and there's two ways for that to happen. Uh, one is that you register your works with the Copyright Office within three months of publication, the first publication. And uh, there's a very technical definition of publication under the Copyright Act. And that is essentially when you first offer another party one of the Section 106 copyright rights um, to make copies, to display or to distribute, um, whether or not they actually do it or not. I mean, if you send the photos to the client and the client doesn't end up using them for whatever reason, um, you still publish it because you sent it to them. So if you register in three, within three months of that date, or uh, if you've registered them before the start of the infringement for uh, a given claim, and if your claim is timely registered, like the whole game shifts because now you have the, the, the option to either pursue um, actual damages and a scorchment of profits or statutory damages. Um, and you have the ability to pursue your attorney's fees. And so the statutory damages are up to 30,000 per claim uh, if it's found to be non-willful. And if it's found to be willful, it can be up to 150,000 per claim. Uh, and so what that does is when you find yourself in a situation where you've been infringed, you you're trying to work it out amicably, i.e. trying to resolve it without actually sending it to an attorney or filing a complaint. Uh, the other party, if you can show that it's registered, um, it just puts you in a much better position to get something done. And then if they don't uh, kind of negotiate in good faith or they blow you off or whatever, then you can pass that case on to a, a, an attorney and they can file and put like maximum pressure on the other side to come to the table and negotiate a deal. So what happens, I have two questions for you. What happens when you don't register within that three month period? It, let's say that I have an artist right now that is uh, wanting to go back and register their archive. Is that a possibility? Is the window gone? What does that what do those options look like for that artist? So the window is definitely not gone. Um, so, you know, for the, the second scenario in which it can be timely, it's if you register it before the start date of an infringement. And so if you've got uh, images out there, they're popular, you know, there's value to them. 
they're inevitably going to get picked up, copied, reused. There's going to be new infringements. So when we uh, when we talk to a new client, for example, that has an archive, a lot of photographers we work with go back decades. Um, you know, they they kind of come into it feeling pretty overwhelmed. Uh, not only the idea that they got to register all these images, but um, the cost. And so I always say, you know, you know, take a breath, just focus on those images that are, whether it's most popular, they've been out there the longest, that, they, that you've licensed them the most, the ones that are most likely to continue being a friend, start registering there. And then as you uh, start to realize the revenue coming from uh, resolving these claims that inevitably occur, then you can reinvest it, some portion of that into registering more and more of the archive. Uh, but really, you just focus on the stuff that's uh, out there and that's most likely to be infringed. So there are companies that will come and say, I have to have the copyright transferred to me in order to be able to pursue infringement claims on on their own behalf. Any thoughts on that, Joe, on how you can talk a client through why they don't need the copyright transferred to them in that scenario? Yeah, I, I'm not sure why a company would say that they need to do that. I'll just put it that way. Um, like when we work with clients, you know, they either own the copyright or their LLC does, or they work with a an agency handling like secondary market sales of licenses. And, uh, you know, so uh, maybe they work with an exclusive licensee to, to distribute the photos. So they would have standing to bring a claim, but otherwise there, there's no reason that a, a copyright holder um, should have to assign their copyright to the company that's helping them resolve the claim. Unless they're doing something that I don't know, you know, what they're doing. But would the model also have a claim that, you know, if there were people in the photograph, the product, other people might have other types of claims that are not copyright? Yeah, I mean, there could be right of publicity claims for sure. For um, sure. Um, we have been able to have conversations with those clients before and agree to terms within our contract that they could pursue the infringer on both the artist's behalf as well as the company's behalf should they find a case where someone is infringing upon the license that they purchased. Um, it just boils down to that, the contract and the contract language. Um, and it, Joe, you said something very interesting and, and um, Shelly, I wanted to get your take on this as well. It, it was something along the lines of having very clear language within a, a contract. Um, and I run a mentorship program for younger photographers and I try to stress that companies are not sending you contracts because they're benevolent. Hey, <laughs> it is not meant <laughs> to be in everyone's best interest. Um, so Shelly, I'm just curious when you're negotiating with a, with a client on a contract, um, how you make sure that you understand the language and, and uh, go about those negotiations. So most of the time I try to send my contract first. Um, because my contract is something that I have looked at and read probably hundreds of times. Um, but specifically when it comes to usage, I actually have a template that I created um, that breaks everything out and it's based on the ASMP book, which I love. It's like my Bible for those that don't have it. I highly recommend going to Amazon and buying it right now or buying it through ASMP. Um, they break down every section that goes into a usage license and you literally can make yourself a template and be like, okay, this, some of those things may not necessarily apply to the type of work you do anymore. But like, you know, if you, you can say this is for organic social only, this is for 
to social media channels. Um, you know, this is only a one-time post and uh, they have archive rights, meaning they don't have to take it down after they post it after a certain time. So you can get super duper specific, which also helps you on the money negotiation side. So if you're working with a client who's like, I want the moon. And you're like, well, you don't have the budget to get to the moon. You have the budget to get to like, you know, five miles down the street. Um, that's where you can like use this template of what is what's in that usage and what do they need. And then uh, the best way to explain it again is in story. So like I had a startup uh, spice company. I write about this on my Instagram. If anybody's been over there, you can see the whole story, but they came to me and they really never worked with, um, a professional photographer. They had no idea really what they were getting into. They asked for everything in the kitchen sink. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys are just trying to start your like online store. So let's start with usage for your online store. And let's see where you are in six months when you actually have money in the door. And then you can take that money and expand your license. And they were like, oh, but we want everything now. Like, we don't want to sign your contract because we want, and I'm like, but you don't actually, one, have the money for it. And two, it just doesn't make sense. Like, you, you're you putting the cart before the horse here. Like, let's see if your product actually goes. And if it goes, then like, you know, expand the licensing for the imagery. And the same thing goes for more established companies. I work a lot in wine. For those that shoot wine, you know, wine bottles, that year on the wine bottle changes every year. Now, yeah, they could go in and Photoshop it and all that good stuff, but they actually have to have the talent to do it and they have to know how to do it. And it's much cheaper for them to just license it for a much shorter period of time and have the photographer come back and shoot the new lot because they might redesign that label. They will have a new year on it. There'll be new flavor tones. There might be like, you know, there's all the mass fires in California that changed the flavor tones. So they actually change the stuff that's in the wine. So thinking through like actually being a solution oriented person for your client Instead of being like, you owe me this and it's X, it's like, no, 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 let's talk about really like, how can I best serve you um, is how I approach it. And when it comes to the language, I use that template to be really specific so that when we're talking about it and when I send the estimate over, that template goes with it. It's a piece of the negotiation that follows all the way through to delivery. And then that template ends up becoming the final doc that gets delivered with the photos at the end. I love Fantastic. what I'm hearing is that you're specific and that is having that job description and having that usage description. And this is something that I think is really important. And I believe it's in the AMA bid guidelines to be clear about what your deliverables are. If people want 20 key visuals, list that out because when people go above that, there's value in the fact that you rocked your shoot day and you gave them extra. Um, and Mary, I see you nodding your, your head as well around the conversation around language in in contracts and in licensing and i know you did a little background research to talk about the tricky ways that sometimes contracts will have conflicting language um mm -hmm. i'd love for you to share share that with us well shelly i was going to ask you when you mentioned presenting your contract first if you're if you're presented right back from that client their master services agreement which potentially has that conflicting language, which is, hey, this supersedes everything and it's work like work for hire is tucked in there, which we've had before. And we've had to go back and call it out and say, you know, our language has to supersede this. And they're like, no, this is our policy. I mean, we had a war with a billion dollar global company who insisted that the image was their IP. And we kept saying the, the product is your IP. The, phot the photograph is the, the photographer's IP. So it is tricky because you will get a purchase order, a master services agreement, something that has conflicting language that totally negates everything you put forward. And if you sign that without reading that, without seeing the specific language that is laid out from the ad agency or from the client, and there's some negation in there to everything that you worked so hard to present and specify, you're screwed, you know? And we're lucky we've just learned 
sometimes the hard way over the years. It comes from a lot of experience in reading these terms and knowing what they mean, but you just have to have a keen eye on where that language is negating exactly what you are trying to give them. Well, Which even in editorial, they, know what yeah, they know what they're I, doing. <laughs> I was just going to say like, even in editorial, that language shows up. So yeah. whether you're talking about big commercial shoots, little commercial shoots or editorial, you'll see like that language, that work for hire type of language or the superseding language will come a lot because the magazines will send you their contract. And the reality is a lot of it's boilerplate. And if you yeah. push back a little bit, um, a lot of times they're, you know, you're like, hey, like, let's make this a win-win for both of us. This is really, this is really written to like protect you, has nothing to do with the artist. This wasn't written with artists in mind. So yeah. we need to like work on this a little bit together to get to a place if we're going to work together. And you have yeah, to. And we have also seen that as well. And, you know, the, the, the brand is a big product company and they said, no, we're going to use our agreement. They sent that. And then the licensing terms for the photography work was kind of appended to it. But, you know, a lot of like, you know, tech companies or product companies, whatever, and their employment agreements or vendor agreements or what have you, they have assignment of invention language, which is basically any work that you're doing for them is owned by them. So think of you're hired by Google as a, a programmer. Any any code you write is owned by Google, not the employee. And so that language was just in their standard contract template. And so when issues came up three, four years down the road, and uh, there's a little bit of a, a, a disagreement, if you will, over the ability to continue use of these images, th they were in a bad situation because this part of the contract said all work done is assigned to the, the client. And this part of the contract said, oh, well, it's only for two years for this much money and you got to pay to renew. And frankly, the fact that either party assigned that kind of led to the conflict. Um, but it just goes to show, like, I'm fully on board with Shelly. Like, use your paper as the contract. But if you are put in a position where you have to use the other side's paper, make sure that you have your copyright attorney go through every single line, even the parts of the contract that don't seem like they apply to what you're doing. Uh, could come back and bite you. Which I think is why it's key to have community, to have network, to have people that you can have, uh, that you can ask questions to. Um, it's why it's important to have a copyright attorney and never sign a contract if you don't understand everything that's in there. Just read it. You can agree to anything. And that for APA, our position is it's up to you what you want to agree to. We're not dictating what the rate should be, but we're asking that you read your contract so that you understand what you've agreed to, because it is really um, easy to have something slipped in that doesn't make sense, as Joe was saying, or is unfair, as Mary was saying. Um, and you need to know that before you've signed your name to it. And, and people get really excited because they're so happy to have the project and they really want to do the job and they think they've agreed to the terms, but the person sending you the contract probably hasn't read it themselves. They were given the contract to send to you. They don't know what's in there. They're not warning you. They're not going to tell you what's in there. You have to go back to them and say, this is in there. This doesn't make sense. And you can do it in a nice, friendly way. Like, hey, this isn't fair. And, you know, just to for clarity, because this is going to be a problem for both of us. And we don't want that. So um, trying to find a way to, to make it work. And that's you know why Shelly's here today also is like, if you have a rep, it's great to have somebody else who's doing that, who's who, you know, so you as a photographer can always be the friendly one. And the rep is the one who's going in there and saying, hey, this is what we need to negotiate. Um, but Shelly's here to say, as a photographer, you can do it for yourself also and do it in a way that's that's meant to be helpful for them as well. That was that was in my notes too, by the way, to, to remember that often the person presenting it to you isn't the person with the authority to do anything. They might not even know what it says either. They just have been told this is our practice. This is what you have to sign. And you might have to go above them or encourage them to go to someone above them. I think the idea of community is really so unbelievably important. Um, I know until the creation of the AMA, um, I would have people tell me, you know, apostrophe is the only one that ever comes back and negotiates on contracts. 
and uh you guys are an anomaly they, yeah yeah like <laughs> oh you know so-and-so agency and so-and-so agency never asks for this sort of thing and they would drop fellow board member names and I'd be like I know they do I can trust that that they do and I'm 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 not trying to be mean I don't think anything that we're trying to advocate for at least within my company is anything but fair fairness and and also in this age where we are all very concerned about AI we'll start to shift the conversation that way because I see that it's starting to pop up in the chat we're trying to preserve this industry and we're trying to be fair for what it is to give our clients what it is that they they need but and and also honor the creativity that comes along with the project and I'm so thankful for the AMA I'm so thankful to the APA and for spaces like Shelly's Instagram where the community can come together and have these conversations so that you don't feel like you're left on on an island um and I see that that things are are starting to pop up in the chat about about AI and we do have language from the AMA that we have created uh that we are encouraging people to review and if it feels appropriate for their business to add to their contracts about uh machine learning um and perhaps um Jen or Madeline you guys could drop a link to that that in the chat. Joe, maybe you can talk a little bit about about adding that legal language and 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 the importance of registering your copyrights in the time time of AI and how that can help you um, when you are seeking damages for infringements. Well, I mean, it's it's a very tricky situation. At the you know, kind of the bottom line is you got to do what you can control. And the things you can control is register your work. Um, it's putting language to protect yourself in your contracts um, and insisting that it be there. Uh, you know, as far as language for prohibiting them from using it for training purposes and so forth, uh, have it. Um, I, there was one comment, like, how would you know that they ever actually did that with it though? Um, well, you may not, but at some point it might come to light. So have the language in the contract, have the images registered, and be in a position to, to enforce your rights and to seek compensation if it does play out that way. Um, I mean, for me, that's the bottom line. Don't get too caught up in the litigation that's going on with, you know, with the, the Gen AI models and so forth. Just do what you can control. And really, those are the two things you can control. Yeah. And if you've given it away already, it's not going to matter. Yeah. I, I think that that is um, really something to, to understand where you also have conflicting terms in, in the contract um, and defining what it means to distribute and edit and make derivative works Um from from your your work and usually that is very much um from what i see just boilerplate template that gets that gets that gets sent out i recently had a contract come to me for an artist and um many times things are moving so fast that the job gets awarded and you have to jump into production right away. And we are forced to start spending money or make commitments to spend money. Um, and our trusted vendors trust that we are going to get our advances in, that we're going to sell the contract through. And so they start that work and we're negotiating the contract. And I had a situation where a contract had conflicting language. And I did not get the contract signed 
back to me um, or actually just the revision that I needed. The job happened over a month ago and it came in my inbox last Friday and I'm still waiting for counter signature. And that's a really scary place to be because my company, we've done the job. We've fronted the money and we're still in, in a space of trying to negotiate that contract. Don't do that, friends. Don't it's do that. Yeah. I say this to humanize myself so everybody knows that like it does, it does happen and it's a very scary place. And okay. trying to have, yeah. Um, and trying to, you know, navigate when jobs are not as plentiful as they were in past years and, and making sure that our artists are wanting to do, they're wanting to do these jobs or wanting to have this happen. Um, and balancing that can be really, really tough. And so I share that vulnerability with you guys so that you know that, that this happens, Mary, it sounds like this happened to you too. Yeah. We just, you know, we had had precedent with a, with a client with whom we worked through an ad agency and they came back to us to shoot directly that summer. And all of it was, you know, proceeded with, it's the same project, it's the same usage, all that stuff. And the day we were pre-lighting, they sprung that MSA on us, which had, which had all that conflicting language. And so it was stressful to have the photographer already pre-lighting, already having received product, ready to shoot. Like, like you said, people were confirmed, about to start. And now I'm negotiating with their general counsel, who was not very nice and not <laughs> very agreeable. And actually, told me I was souring the business relationship. And the only person who would suffer was the photographer because I was negotiating. And like you spring your contract on me the day we're pre-lighting. That's not fair. Yeah. Yeah. In this instance, we had already gotten the advance too. So I was like very confused at the conflicting, conflicting terms. Um, Shelly, are you hearing that from your community as well? Do you, do you find that photographers are running into those instances um, I think we're running into all kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm in a bunch of different groups and I live, I, I live in two countries. So I'm in England and I'm in the U S so I hear different things happening in different parts of the world. Um, so for those that don't know, I do split my time between London and California. And, um, it's interesting because over here, just like we have the APA in the States that we all love and adore, we have the AOP over here in England and the, what's happening at a rap, much rapid or fast, rapid is not a word, much faster pace is um, the discussion around like AI and usage and who gets the right. Um, and so for anybody that is interested in that conversation, because I believe that the EU is gonna lead the way in that conversation, um, they're currently debating it right now. Um, and the president at AOP is very, at, is very much an advocate there. And so you hear a lot around worry I don't want to say stress, but like some worry around like, what's it going to look like? But then on the flip side, when I talk to some other photographers who are embracing like what that could look like and using it as a creative tool and not seeing it as like the demigoggin from, you know, um, Stranger Things, um, they're, they're more, there's a lot of really cool things we could be doing with AI and uh, ways that we could be stretching our catalog and adding more images. Um, one photographer in particular comes to mind where he was showing me some really cool stuff. Like he had taken these portraits of these people. Uh, he does a lot of like lifestyle on the go out in the mountains. And he's like, you know, but this one, and he's like, for some reason, like I didn't get them all like happy and like smiling and like, he's like, they're a little bit more somber photos. He's like, but with the use of like AI, I can take those same photos and I can turn her head a little bit and I can make her smile a little bit and I can change her eye angle a little bit. And now that set of maybe like 10 to 15 images just became a set of like 50 to 60 images of which then I can up license, right? So there's ways that we can really be maximizing the tools at our hand that I hadn't really thought about before. And, um, I think there's some cool opportunities. I mean, other things that I see out there people are running into is they just don't know what they don't know until it hits them in the head. Um, and I see that a lot, right? So we're all at different places in our career and we all are exposed to different information. And um, there's a lot of people saying like, well, you know, I finished the job. <laughs> I finished the job and I'm ready to turn over the images. And now they're telling me it's a full, you know, they it's it's a buyout. And I'm like, but it, but when did you go back and say, can you define what you mean by buyout, right? Like, are do you know the language and the questions to ask to better assist yourself in having that conversation? 
And that at the heart of it is really what I see over and over again is just people don't know the follow-up question to ask to get the clarification. Um, and so that's when having community to Juliet's point and, um, and Kelly, even to your point about like AMA, right, is like having community can really help you uh, get some idea of like what to go back to and maybe how to negotiate. And I mean, that's like why I love the image maker groups that are out there on Facebook. It's why I'm, I like my dark light group that I'm on WhatsApp with. I run a group too. I'm in focus on women. I also run another thing called creative camp. Um, so like, you know, if you don't have someone to ask questions of, like Lisa Lee, who's in the chat, Lisa and I are good friends and we go way back. And, you know, when she started off, we met actually on Clubhouse in a Clubhouse room talking about these exact things, like how to start a business. What are the questions you ask? What do you put in a contract? Um, so I think if you really want to be a savvy business owner, which we all want to be savvy business owners, and the reality is as an artist, you're doing 80% business and 20% creative. So I really encourage everybody to lean into understanding their the business side of what they're doing um, and spending more time there. I love that. I, I, I think our community also needs to um, begin to educate what's happening over when we're shooting alongside live action as well. Um, and that side of the industry has typically, you know, back in the seventies, their industry standard was work for hire. Um, and that they don't, uh, often know about photographer copyrights. Um, Mary, are you finding that as well when you're negotiating for shooting alongside broadcast, shooting alongside live action shoots? Absolutely. I've been approached by many production companies who out of the gate say it's it's work for hire and I retaliate. I'm like, no, it is not. <laughs> um, and again, that's why this education is crucial. We're out there. Uh, and I think when we were at the AICP week handing out those cards, so many people were grateful because they didn't even know what usage was, directors and producers. And I think it's so important for us to continue to educate our community because then we don't run into that, Shelly, when someone, or what you said earlier, Kelly, with someone saying, well, so-and-so doesn't do that. And so-and-so it's like, yeah, we're all talking. So we know very well that we are doing that. And that's yeah. where the education is crucial. But yes, I do get approached all the time, like by production companies and broadcast. And, and to clarify, education doesn't mean colluding. Education just means sharing what it is that you do. Ultimately, you're going to make the best choice for your business in terms of how you price yourself. And it might be, you know, in a particular situation where, with a client where you feel comfortable transferring your copyright. I really truly hope that's not the case and but no judgment because you're going to make the decision that's best for for your for your business. We're just here to make sure that everybody understands what some of the alternatives are. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes left left in the conversation. Just wondering if there's any questions within the chat um from anyone we want to make sure that we have we have time for people to to ask some follow-up questions. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. I will and, say and Kelly, on that conversation about um, work for hire for a production company, I know in a previous conversation that we've had, you brought up why there's there was value to production companies signing a work for hire that is not transferred to photographers doing a work for hire. I wonder if you could speak to that. Remind me of when this conversation was. So I think it was when we were prepping for the, when we were talking about having this webinar and you were saying that there's, um, there are uh, the value of a production company, what they're getting for, what they're being paid that's yes. in, the, in the work for hire of a commercial is different than a photographer who's doing the print portion of it. So they're not getting the same benefits Yes. Out of the, the project. It's a different, it's a little bit of a different compensation model. Um, you know, it, uh, and I will say that I do know there is a conversation that is happening with live action production companies around, hey, once upon a time, way back when, when, it, you know, TV was the only place or the primary place that you were going to put a video and you were promoting 
package goods and deodor or deodorants or whatever that 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 made sense for that time and now uh the industry has changed so much shouldn't we revisit this conversation around our directors and and their copyright especially in light of things like the Under Armour um, ad that that recently came out and sent some shockwaves throughout the industry. So there is a conversation that is beginning to be had over there. And I think through um, photographers saying, I would love to shoot alongside you. I'd love to shoot over the shoulder. I'd love to help you with your shoot. I'd love to have a conversation with you about usage um, and how that works over on our side of the industry and having that having that conversation um you know people oftentimes just want things to be easy but if you are explaining to them it, at least it starts to open the door and people hear it more and more with the live action production company the markup model is um how is the primary mode of of compensation. So that's anywhere from 18 to 26 percent um, from what I've heard um, that they are charging a markup for for a project and they don't take commission on on the director's fees. Um, that's just kind of broad strokes as far as I as I understand it. So they are making the production companies are making a considerable amount of of markup. They aren't as concerned with usage rights in the same way that artist representatives whose historically primary driver of income has been commissions based on artist fees. Um, so artist representatives have been more enticed to preserve usage fees and to preserve larger fees for the artists that they represent as a whole um, with the way in which treatments and the cost of pitching and bidding has grown, um, charging administrative costs um, have become more of a norm for us as well, although not on the same level that we see with within live action companies. So there's some some models that are shifting and changing as we start to see stills and motion shoots come, come together. And I think that's something for artists to also think about in terms of what are their insurances? What are their treatment costs? How are those things being reimbursed when they are um, winning, winning a job? Because that it, it used to be the case that someone would call me for a book and then I'd get a bid and I'd bid it and it was, um, and I'm not that old. <laughs> but it brings up a good point about valuing your work again, the whole point of the conversation, yeah. right? It's like you have value to get to that day where the, where the shoot is actually taking place. There's all the history and the knowledge and the, the getting it right that takes place. It's like sometimes it feels like photographers are being told is all you did was show up and click the shutter it's like oh my goodness there's so much that takes place before that day ever happened so the idea of trying to simplify somehow this process um, is insulting and a way to negotiate you down where actually you bring a lot of value to the project yeah. Kelly, i have a follow-up question for you on the stills motion hybrid um or coming together question so Recently, like a couple people have talked about how they have been tapped by a live action or motion company to come on as the still shooter and they work out the contract and the negotiation and all that stuff. And then they go and then they find that in the end, the stills have a much longer life than the video and are used in a much broader stroke than the video, right? Because if you sit and think about it for a minute, stills can go a lot more places that video can't. Um, and is there... Like, are there conversations you're having around that piece that could be helpful for the still shooter that are that are working more and more with motion as we come together more and more? Like how to talk about your your imagery can live farther and broader than 
the video and making sure you're asking, like, what are the questions you need to be asking of that team? Um, I think it goes back to that job description and having that conversation and presenting options to the production company um, and having having an educational moment of, of, of what it looks like. And look, sometimes people are just like, hey, I've got X amount of money and this is what I need. And I have found, and Mary, I'd love to know your perspective. I have found that when my artist is in that situation where somebody is like, look, I just carved out X amount of budget. I just need to get this done that they have a miserable experience on that set that they don't, they don't get images that they can use for self-promotion because they weren't thought of, their unit wasn't thought of, there wasn't time in the schedule for them. They, people just assume that they can shoot over the shoulder and get the right eye line and it just never really works out. Now, when we work with a production company where we can have that educational moment, where we can explain what we need, when we can talk about, hey, we need to have someone from your production team with our unit fighting for them. We need to have a conversation with the AD about what's realistic for us to shoot within the day. Those shoots are the shoots where the stills are the best and where we walk away with something to promote and the clients are really happy and where we've able to, been able to have that conversation around usage. And so when I say like, you know, this is just for some BTS um, and, and some, some social, um, or typically work for hire, I'm like, okay, well, listen, if you want BTS and social, this is what this rate is. Yeah. If you want a complete copyright transfer, we don't do that. We would give you unlimited time, unlimited use in perpetuity, and this is how much that costs. Can we have a conversation about this? And usually they're like, this fits within the budget. Let me go back and talk to the client. They have that conversation. We do a lot of shooting alongside live action as, as people have been needing more and more content that's been very, I didn't think it could get more popular. It's gotten more popular this year. So in those instances, everyone has a better experience because the stills are valued. Mary, do you find that to be the case as well? 100%. And everything you just said, one of uh, an artist on our roster just chimed in that she just had this experience uh, recently too. We had another photographer who was on a motion set, a commercial set with a celebrity for whom I used to work before I was an agent. And we, we it was such a missed opportunity because she was just so second class and that situation was horrible. They had no budget. They didn't allocate the appropriate amount of time for her to get in and out of the, the set. So they just didn't value it in the way they should have. And it was a missed opportunity for everybody because those would have been amazing images for us to share too. And we walked away with just nothing useful, like nothing. Um, and then looked at her portfolio and her approach to stills and said, but you do it this way on this set with no support. It was just horrendous. <laughs> it's not a good experience, like you said. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's about having uh, having the clear communication and and the willingness to be I've been using the word vulnerable a lot in this conversation but th the honesty of, of what it is what it is that's needed and there are times where you know an artist is gonna say this is worth it to me I just want the paycheck I don't care like, you you as an artist and for your finances and for your life you have to you have to make that decision um but I really think that there are, I know I know I have I know my agents have I know my rep friends have had a lot of success by just having having the comfort the conversation around around usage yeah. um it's been, I could talk to you guys all day. Uh, it's been so, so amazing. Is there any last questions in the chat? Um, everyone's feeling very shy about this, but that's okay. You can follow up with us. No, it is. A, it's a big topic. It always is. And I feel like you touched on something very important about the evolution 
of our industry. And here we are with AI, right? Um, to back to your point about motion being on that little box back in the day. Now it's on billboards outside. It's at the end of your in caps and grocery stores. It's all over your telephone. We're walking around with people's videos now. So I, I agree that I love that we're having the conversation across both these mediums and we should be educating them on usage. And, you know, hopefully I'd love to see that change for them as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure we will be revisiting this topic in the future. Thank you to everyone who was able to make it and join us for the hour. Thank you to Juliet from the APA, Joe from Image Rights, Shelly, so lovely having you a part of this conversation. And Mary, you're just one of the smartest women I know. So thank you, everybody. Kelly. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Have a good one. Hi, everyone.